This is going to be verse by verse of Hebrews chapter 5. And we're also going to talk about the topic of being skillful in the Word and some things that need to accompany your skills in the Word of God. You need to have skills with the Bible. You need to have the Bible memorized in certain places. You need to read the Bible. You need to study the Bible. But there should be some things that accompany those skills that you have in the Bible. And the first one we'll look at is compassion. If you know a lot of Bible, and yet you lack compassion for people, then your skills just aren't going to profit anyone except you. Because the average man isn't concerned with how much you know about the Bible. He's concerned with how friendly you are to him, and how much you care about him. Uh, if you don't have compassion, then all the knowledge that you've compiled is nothing more than makes you feel better about yourself. That's it. In the Old Testament, God used the Levites, specifically Aaron and his sons, to be the high priest. Being regular men themselves, they could have compassion on the infirmities of others because they were going through the same exact things. But now, Hebrews 5, 1 and 2. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant? And on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. So God uses men to perform the things of God. And God can use you today, as a Christian, to do something for him. The greatest work you can do is the work of the Lord. But you need compassion to do that. And you may not offer gifts and sacrifices for sins as they did in the Old Testament, since Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice and Jesus Christ paid for our sin once and for all. However, you can offer spiritual gifts and sacrifices in other ways. Not to get saved, of course, but because you love God. Hebrews thirteen fifteen says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So when is the last time you thanked God for not killing For not killing you? Offer the sacrifice of praise continuously. When's the last time you praised God for saving you and not putting you in hell? When's the last time you just prayed to God and praised him while thanking him for everything that he's given you? Paul says in Philippians 2.17, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. When is the last time you sacrificed your time to minister to other Christians? Paul sacrificed his life to edify other people. He had compassion on them. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what's that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Present your body a living sacrifice. People today, they don't want to sacrifice anything. All they care about is themselves. They have no compassion for God. They have no compassion for people. But if you present your body a living sacrifice, you're turning away the lusts of the flesh. You are living a life that is holy. You are living a life where you put others first. It is a sacrifice to turn away sinful things and live for others and for God. Even though God isn't using priests today like he did in the Old Testament. And he surely isn't using men as priests like the Catholic Church does. Still, as a Christian, you are part of a royal priesthood according to 1 Peter 2.9. But Hebrews 5.2 says, Who can have compassion on the in ignorant? Do you have compassion to go along with all the Bible knowledge you've compiled? Who can have compassion on the ignorant? And on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. That talking about that high priest who he can have compassion on people when he's offering those sacrifices in the Old Testament because he also was going through the same thing. Compassion is key. When you read the Gospels, you will see how Jesus had compassion. He was willing to spend his time suffering with somebody else, then eventually suffered for the sins of all mankind on the cross. And today you have no compassion from people. They don't want to do any suffering. They want constant pleasure. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. 
lovers of their own selves. But who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Someone who has been through hard times can have more compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. The high priest was compassed with infirmity, so he understood the people. He even had to offer sacrifices for his own sins before he offered for the people. But Jesus Christ is different. He's a better high priest because he didn't have to sacrifice for his own sin. He was the perfect sacrifice for our sin because he was sinless. He is a better high priest than Aaron or Aaron's sons. As it says in Hebrews seven twenty six and 27, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So Jesus Christ was obviously skillful in the word. And Matthew seven twenty eight talks about how the people were astonished at his doctrine. Luke four twenty six through 27 talks about how the doctors of the law were even astonished at his understanding and answers when he was just a boy. In Luke twenty four forty seven he expounded the Old Testament to the disciples. He was what you call a Bible man. He was a Bible believer, a Bible reader, had it memorized. I mean, he is the living word. The Bible is the written word. Hebrews 5, 3. And by reason hereof he ought... As for the people, so offer so also for himself to offer for sins. Talking about that high priest. As for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. So you see that earthly high priest had to offer something for his own sins. Unlike Jesus, he wasn't sinless. But the high priest taken from among men have to offer sacrifices for their own sins first. So Jesus Christ had to leave the riches of heaven. He came down to earth as the God-man to pay for our sins. We needed a high priest who was sinless, and that's what we got. So compassion is needed with your skills in the book. Another thing that is needed is a calling. In Hebrews 5, 4, it says, And no man taketh his dishonor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So a man could not call himself to be a high priest. No man taketh this honor unto himself. But he that is called of God, as was Aaron. He called Aaron and the sons of and the sons of Aaron to be high priest. And to go along with your skills in the Word of God, you need a calling. You need compassion. You need a calling. If you have the desire to do something for God, to believe his words over your own motives, to be willing to stay faithful and be willing to say, Lord, here am I, send me then God's going to use you. He's going to call you for something. You may not be called to preach or pastor or hold some type of office, but every Christian is called to evangelize. Every Christian is called to preach the gospel. That is to tell everyone you know about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So while you are paying, or wait, excuse me, while you're praying about your calling, be sure to do what every Christian is called to do in the meantime. You need to tell people how to be saved. You can get so busy sharpening your skills in the Word that you forget about the other callings that you have. So you need compassion. You need a calling. Hebrews 5.5 5, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So it wasn't Christ that glorified himself to be a made a high priest. It was the one that said, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So that means the Father himself made Jesus Christ a high priest. The Father himself called him a son. And the Father himself called Jesus Christ God in Hebrews 1. Jesus Christ had many callings on him. And he was skillful in the word. He had things to go along with those skills. So Jesus Christ is our high priest. Now, we don't need a sinful man to be a priest for us like the Catholics teach. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the God-man. God the Father himself called him to be our high priest. And Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. This makes him equal with God. So Jesus is a better high priest than Aaron. Hebrews 5, 6. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is an interesting man the man Melchizedek 
and Jesus, he's similar to Jesus. Uh, they're both called a priest forever. Jesus is our priest forever. Jesus is eternal. Jesus Christ didn't just begin in a manger. That is how he came down in the flesh. Before that, he had always been here. He's from everlasting. He is the Ancient of Days. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. He is compared to Melchizedek because Melchizedek was a Gentile high priest. Jesus Christ is a better high priest than Aaron because he's not limited to the Jews. He goes to the Gentiles. Hebrews 5, 7 says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard than that he feared. You see that verse 7 referring to Jesus. And we see something else that you need to go along with your Bible skills. You need prayer. It says, When he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard and that he feared. So Jesus Christ was a prayer warrior. He had skills. They were astonished at his word and uh, his doctrine. They... Are, they were astonished at his understanding, but he was a prayer warrior that went along with his Bible skills. Jesus Christ, the God-man, took on likeness of sinful flesh, and that is why it says in the days of his flesh, and in the days of his flesh he prayed. Romans 8, 3 says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin the flesh. So Jesus Christ prayed when he was down here in the flesh. He prayed to the Father and left us a pattern of good works. Jesus Christ left the riches of heaven to cry and shed tears for a man because he had that first thing you need, compassion. And he is a prayer warrior. His tears were so great that they were as great drops of blood. As it says in Luke twenty two forty four, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat were as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I don't believe he was praying to get out of dying on the cross, because God promises from the foundation of the world that there would be eternal life, and that life could only come through Jesus Christ. And he knew that, as it says in Titus 1, 2, And hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. He promised that to Jesus. Jesus Christ was with the Father before the world began. That is who God made the promise to. Jesus Christ already knew that it was the perfect will of God. Jesus wasn't trying to get out of dying for all of mankind. He was wanting the cup to pass. The cup is God's wrath, which was poured out on Jesus Christ while he was on the cross. And this brought temporary separation between him and the Father. Because he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Hebrews 5, 7, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared. So are you praying before you read the Bible? Are you praying before you study the Bible? Are you praying at night and in the morning and in the middle of the day that God's going to open that book up to you and you can apply everything you read to your life? But notice again, it says unto him that was able to save him from death. It isn't saying that Jesus prayed not to die, but that God was able to save him from death. Jesus Christ willingly offered himself on the cross. He wasn't forced into it. The end of the verse said, and was heard, and that he feared. If you are a born-again believer, then you can go to God in prayer. This is something you should that should go along with your Bible reading and your studying, as I said. Notice that verse said, unto him that was able to save him from death. So God is able to save you from any situation, any person, any place, anything, any circumstance, pain, or anything. Why wouldn't you go to him in prayer? And if you ask for wisdom, he says he'll give it to you. You open the book and read it, get the skills in the word of God, but also pray along with it. Have compassion. Do what God's called you to do. Why wouldn't you talk to him before you read the Bible? You talk to him and then read the Bible, that's how he talks to you. Jesus Christ was always heard of God. That verse said he was heard and that he feared. Jesus was always heard of God. He is our mediator. And we pray, when we pray to Jesus Christ, 
He gets our prayers to the Father. It says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is our high priest. We don't need a man as a high priest today. Next, suffering isn't something that should go along with your... Suffering is something that should go along with your skills in Bible reading. You may not be physically tortured for the faith, but if you're preaching and teaching what you're learning out of the Bible, then you're going to do some suffering. That's something that should go along with your skills in the Word. This may be just from rejection that you have from your family. People thinking you're crazy. People think that you don't know how to have fun. People that think it's strange that you're not doing it the, the same way they're doing it. But you're going to see some persecution in some way. Even if it's just a little persecution, it's still persecution. Jesus Christ, even though he was sinless, suffered more than any man. Hebrews 5.8 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. You need some suffering that goes along with your skills in the Word of God. Now, you don't try to bring it up on yourself. It's just something that goes along with it. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, God came down to man to experience what man experiences. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus Christ had to go through all the pain that got me and you saved. He had to go through this life, live a sinless life, go through all that pain and suffering, suffer on the cross. He experienced physical pain, getting tired, sweating, hunger, thirsty, heat, cold, and nakedness and was tempted in all points like as we are. And then the devil could no longer look at God and say that he had never experienced what man experienced. Jesus Christ came down and experienced it all, but did it better than any man ever did it. And he did that for us because he had compassion. He had compassion to go along with his skills in the Word of God. They were, under, they were astonished at his doctrine. But he was also a prayer warrior. He also had compassion. He was also willing to suffer for us. So suffer. Follow the Lord's example. Next, you need to be obedient. Hebrews 5, 9 says, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. This is the obedience of faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If you're really skillful in the word, are you going to have enough faith to do what it says? Hebrews 5, 9. In being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So, the being made perfect doesn't have to do with being sinless. Jesus Christ never sinned. So it can't mean that he was made sinless because he's always been sinless. He was made perfect in that he left heaven, came down to this world, lived a sinless life, experienced life as a man, and died on the cross for our sins. He was perfect to be our substitute on the cross. So he is the captain of our salvation, the author. This is his story. It's history, history and it tells the future prophecy, and it's his story. Eternal salvation began with him. And the phrase where it says, to all that obey him, is referring to the obedience of faith. Romans 16, 26 says, But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Will you trust and obey? Or are you just reading the Bible like it's just some type of fairy tale to, to get not more knowledge in your mind? Next, you need to open your ears. Are you continuously learning? Is the Bible going in one ear and out the other? If you're really skillful, then you'll continuously grow. You can't grow unless you really open your ears and take the Bible for real. It isn't just a children's storybook. But it says in Hebrews 5, 10 through 11, Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. Many things about Melchizedek are hard to be uttered because people can't handle strong meat. They're dull of hearing because many Christians seem to be spiritually deaf. They have no interest in the Bible. They are more interested in things of the world. And many Christians read the Bible, but they don't have their ears open to receive anything other than the, the practical things. They don't want to get into the strong meat of the Word. 
But Hebrews 5.12 says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So there are men in their 40s and 50s who should have their own Bible classes to teach. However, they don't know anything about the Bible. They're stuck as a spiritual baby. And babes desire the sincere milk of the Word. They can't handle the meat yet. This is why it's hard to teach adult Christians who have been saved for 40 years. All they know is John 3.16. They only know that because Stephen Curry or some athlete mentioned it. But most Christian men today are so dumb when it comes to the Bible. They can't eat meat. They have no in interest in it. They're concerned with their job. They're concerned with sports. But Hebrews 5.13 says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So they don't have any skills. They can, they can fix anything. They can play golf. They can hunt. They can fish. They can fix the car. They can supervise people at work. They can run any machine at the factory and can't give you any Bible doctrine because they're so spiritually brain dead. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. It's a sad thing that they, they never grew to a point where they could teach others. Hebrews 5.14 says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Bodily exercise profiteth little. Exercise yourself rather to godliness. As it says in 1 Timothy 4.7, 1 Timothy 4, 8 said, bodily exercise profiteth little. What are people more concerned about, bodily exercise or spiritual exercise? Most of them just worry about the bodily exercise. But the more you read the Bible and study and pray, the more you're exercising your senses, you'll be able to tell the difference between good and evil. You'll be able to see what is good and bad doctrine. You'll be able to teach others and swallow strong meat for yourself. But these have just been a few things to go along with your skills in the Word of God.